My name is Eddie Schwartz. I'm a songwriter from Canada, and this is a presentation about a new initiative called Fair Trade Music. Like most of us who create music professionally, I didn't become a songwriter and an artist because I was motivated by money. Far from it. I did it because I loved music so much, I couldn't do anything else. But, having now been in the music business my whole life, I know that you simply can't make music without money. And making music has become unsustainable for most of us because of the collapse of the value of music in the digital world since the beginning of this century. This is a problem that no one who cares about music, or those of us who devote our lives to it, can ignore. So once upon a time, a million sales would generate for the songwriter or songwriters about $45,000. And you would have been awarded a platinum record, which was a pretty big deal. Now contrast that today with earnings from digital streaming services. A million streams will earn the songwriter or songwriters about $35. So to put that in perspective, that's almost literally a 100% drop in earnings. And a modest middle-class income has been reduced to a pizza. It's a nice pizza. You could probably get a couple of extra toppings, but it's still a pizza. And this catastrophic drop in earnings has happened at the same time that CEOs of well-known streaming services are awarding themselves multi-million dollar bonuses. I'm not talking about their regular salaries. I'm just talking about their bonuses. Owning a record or a CD provided unlimited access to the music of your choice. And that's exactly what streaming services also provide. And that's why some people are calling streaming the new ownership. Well, either way, the idea that the intrinsic value of the music is entirely dependent on the technology you use to access it seems, frankly, ludicrous, especially when fortunes are being built by providing access to that very same music. So it's not like we're not aware of and haven't been trying to fix this problem for some time. And most of our efforts have had to do with these things, copyright reform and other legal remedies for which we need the active participation of government. And it would be great if copyright reform and enlightened regulation caught up with technology and the digital marketplace at some point in the 21st century. And we must continue to facilitate that process. We must continue to work with and lobby government. But also, we need to find a way around the perennial gridlock at the intersection of copyright and politics. And a growing number of us believe that alternative path starts with developing easily understandable ways to communicate and engage with our own community and the wider world. And that idea has led us here. In order to understand how fair trade can work for music, we need to look at how it transformed coffee. Now, fair trade is a remarkable communication tool because at the exact moment a consumer is deciding which coffee to buy, fair trade gives them the information they need to do the right thing, to be the last link in a fair value chain that pays the farmers. And its success over the last 25 years has proven that many people want to do the right thing when given the information they need to do so. And businesses that sell and distribute coffee need to be seen on the side of the good guys, so they go fair, both for competitive reasons and to burnish their corporate image. Starbucks is a perfect example. Fair trade music would do the same thing. It would inform consumers, no matter what technology they use to enjoy music, who pays and who plays fair. And it would also inform creators who to do business with and who they may wish to avoid. And like coffee, a certification process would be involved. But we'll get to that shortly. There are already 
over 25,000 music creators from around the world who endorse and support fair trade music. These include music creators from Africa, from Latin and South America, from Europe and North America as well. And most recently, we've reached out to our colleagues in Asia. But what really is fair to everyone in the music value chain? Clearly, we needed to know. And for that reason, we reached out to an economist. His name is Pierre Lalonde. And Mr. Lalonde has many years of experience when it comes to the valuation of music in different business models. And that is because he worked for many years at the Copyright Board of Canada and Canada's Heritage Ministry, which oversees cultural matters, including music. And thanks to Mr. Lalonde's research, we now have a knowledgeable, authoritative, and I think fascinating account of not only what is happening in the digital music value chain, but the study has provided some very solid ground on which to build a fair trade music system. So, the study concerning fair compensation for music creators in the digital age. And here's what the study tells us. Well, not a surprise, music is undervalued by streaming services. And the amount it's undervalued depends on the specific service. On average, 96 cents of every music industry dollar goes to major record labels. Now, I'm no mathematical genius, so please check my figures, but it seems to me that leaves four cents for everyone else. The study also addresses what a fair and equitable division would be between the rights vested in the song and the rights vested in the master recording. And the figure that Mr. Lalonde comes up with is 50-50. Now, the methodology Mr. Lalonde uses to come to this and all the conclusions in the study is available online, and so there's no need for us to delve into it in any detail right now. But it's important to note that this is not new, that sync licenses and other licenses have been valued this way for decades. The song and the recording are treated as of equal value. Okay transparency. Clearly one of the most important areas the study examines and absolutely essential to any fair trade music system. What we do know is in some ways what we don't know about hidden advances, about minimums and guarantees. We know that the major labels have equity positions in some streaming services. And we know that there are revenues from data mining which may well be an enormous source of revenue, both now and in the future. It turns out that music is one of the most accurate ways of determining your individual tastes and patterns of consumer behavior. And that information is extremely valuable to advertisers, and it is being monetized. So one last really quite astounding finding of the study is that streaming services are predicted to be a $50 billion a year industry within the next five years. If those predictions are accurate, then streaming will be a bigger business than the music business has ever been before. So the study concerning fair compensation for music creators in the digital age gives us a lot of essential information we need to build a fair, transparent, and ethical value chain for music creators. The way I look at it, it gives us a compass. It points to true north, so that we can begin the journey to a sustainable place for those of us who create the music, and also for everyone else in the music value chain. Now, there's no question that music creators have to be front and center in building a fair trade music system. But we certainly can't do this alone. In fact, we're going to need all the help we can get. We need to build support in our own community, of course, but also from our colleagues who are music publishers, 
from those at collective management societies around the world. We're also going to need good folks at record labels, both large and small, and the streaming services themselves. Because working together, we can develop fair criteria that we can all live by in order to achieve a sustainable ecosystem for all of us. So if you love music, if you create music, or if you just want to live in a world where people can devote their lives to making great music, please join us in building fair trade music. Thank you.